our church bell just rang, so that is always a wonderful sign to have a slow start into the session. My name is Henning Bergen, and I'm very happy to welcome all of you. I expect a couple of more participants will join in the uh, next couple of seconds and minutes. So we'll just have a short and brief start into the event. Welcome to today's uh, webinar on actuaries and the emergence of data science. I guess many of you know that the Actuarial Association of Europe on a regular basis um, offers webinars on current and interesting topics for the profession. Today, it's um, our pleasure of the AAE Education Committee to run today's event. Um, this is what we have planned for the next round about two hours, just a short welcome and brief introduction. Then we have one um, larger block on actuaries and the emergence of data science. Then um, with um, yeah, to, to the end and, and after a specific Q&A session on um, this large block, we'll talk about one or two um, minor topics um, of the education committee just to give you a brief update. And in the end, we'll have um, the opportunity for a short closing and wrap up session. Um, for questions, use the Q&A section in the um, Zoom menu bar. And at the end of the larger presentation, we have um, more than enough time to answer questions that might be there from your side. Who are the, um, well, per persons to look out for today? Uh, as, as I said, my name is Henning Wagen. I'm a um, qualified actuary and member of the German Association of Actuaries, currently chairing the AAE Education Committee. And it's a pleasure to have with me today, Colm Fitzgerald. Colm is a lecturer in actuarial science at University College Dublin. Uh, he's a fellow of the Society of Actuaries in Ireland and also of the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries. Um, he's a very active volunteer in the profession, locally and especially internationally. He's um, currently the representative of the IFOA in the AAE Education Committee. Um, and he, in this position, chairs the task force um, of the AAE uh, on a data science syllabus and will present in this capacity today. So, Colm, with two minutes gained for your presentation, which is significantly more interesting than the welcome and um, the introduction, very happy to hand over to you again to all um, colleagues joining the webinar, use the Q&A section. Um, and at the end of Colm's presentation, we will have more than enough time to go into details if something's open and needs to be discussed. So Colm, happy to hand over to you and the floor is yours. Excellent. Cheers, Annie. I am, I'll just share my screen here now. Okay, uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you all for joining us for the webinar this morning. <clears throat> um, the aim of the webinar is to share with you um, and to inform you of the current draft of the uh, new AAE data science uh, syllabus. Um, one of the other aims is to invite you to to share your opinions, um, your comments, you, your views on it. Um, I think for it to be a success, um, the more kind of input that we have, um, the more likely um, that that is. Um, to introduce the task force, um, there's myself, uh, Christian Fuhrer from the Denmark Olivier Lopez from France, <coughs> Philip Maihi um, from Germany, Jean-Claude de Pouter from Belgium, <coughs> and Frank Weber from Switzerland. <coughs> As an overview, um, I'll look at the objectives that we have set. Um, I'll look at the research that we've undertaken and um, the 
challenges that we, we've seen. And then I'll come into the actual uh, syllabus itself. And we look at some of the principles that we used, and then we will give an overview um, of the syllabus itself. Um, I guess the aim is to kind of not present everything that we've come up with. Um, our, our aim has been to present it in a way that's easy for you to um, see it, it could kind of an overview of things. We've also given some kind of granular information as well, but only to the extent that it, it might help you um, give some comments um, back afterwards. Um, we, we'll also then um, end by looking at some next steps and see if we can have some uh, Q&A from you um, on things. So in terms of the, um, in terms of the objectives, um, we were we were set uh, a, a task to uh, draft an AAE that that data science syllabus as support for member associations around Europe. Um, as as part of that, we were to liaise with other member associations around the world and also in Europe um, and also with universities and other other um, institutions um, in the actuarial and the data science fields in order to get an under understanding of what uh, exists out there. And this is probably comparable to what you do in academic research where you do a literature review um, to work out what, what is the norm that that's out there. And then um, the third part is to draft a structure um, on how a data science syllabus could be presented to potential uh, participants, um, especially as a CPD offering. Um, Almost implicit in, in that as well is that um, one thing that we found was that in spite of um, the creation of similar uh, syllabi around the world, there didn't seem to be a huge amount of attraction of actuaries to them. Um, so we'd see that one of our aims would be to make what whatever we would come up with to be at, um, attractive to actuaries. It would also need to be attractive to employers. Um, what we found uh, from talking to employers and others was that uh, there didn't seem to be a significant value placed on additional actuarial qualifications um, more than, say, um, experience. And also what we we're aiming to do would be to enhance the, the reputation of, of actuaries and to I, ideally build on actuarial tradition. So um, as, as, a, as a kind of quick recap on the research that we've done, so we reviewed the data science syllabuses uh, created by other actuarial associations around the world, including in Europe. Um, so for, for, for example, in the IFOA in France, uh, G -G Germany, Switzerland, uh, the Nordic Association, Spain, Ireland, and we also reviewed uh, what's happening in the US, Australia, and in Canada. Um, the views on the task force was that the Australian uh, pre-qualification offering seemed to be probably the standout, um, and the Swiss one for post-qualification was as well too. Um, although um, what was what's been um, offered by the IFA and in the US also stood out a lot. Um, the certificate in the data science by the IFA is being opened up as well. Um, I understand to others in Europe. In terms of the other kind of significant part of 
the research was to, to review um, something that you may or not be aware of, which is the uh, work of the Alliance for the Data Science uh, Professionals in the UK. If you think traditionally, um, you know, we're actuaries, we do a lot of numbers, but we also have kind of wider skills. Um, often, if you think of a data scientist, you might think of, say, someone with a PhD in physics or maths, and they have lots of kind of uh, math skills, and they seem to be organizing themselves almost in, in a similar way to, to ourselves, uh, where they have uh, broader um, things on their education other than um, just the maths. Uh, the IFA are looking to join this particular alliance and their website sets out standards that they have agreed for data scientists. Um, the other main part of the research was to reach out to kind of high caliber actuaries and the data scientists and other related professionals. So I'd like to thank all of the above um, for their help. I'll mention some of it as we go through the things. So, um, what do we see as the perceived uh, challenges uh, for actuaries in this particular space? Um, well, I, I think it was um, Thomas Hardy who said that if a way to the better there be, it first entails a full look at the worst. Um, so th there has been some kind of challenges for the actuarial profession. This is probably an IFOA centric uh, viewpoint in that uh, traditionally when or even when I left college uh, 25 years or so ago um, in an insurance company uh, the actuarial uh, function had the main responsibility for managing uh, the solvency um, that changed um, to a degree in, um, after the failure of equitable life and the introduction of solvency 2 um, what happened then was that the position of actuaries in the almost hierarchy of responsibility for maintaining solvency, that switched to the risk management um, area and actuarial almost uh, was, was a part of that now. Um, what's happened though is that most of the actuaries I know in, in Ireland, almost all the CRO roles um, are held by actuaries, but the the overall position of actuarial in that hierarchy has changed. So um, because of that, it's probably natural that we are facing competition from the data scientists and others who um, might see themselves as being able to perform our, our roles. Um, one of the issues here is in relation to kind of character and ethical credibility. Um, I'm I'm kind of a big student of actuarial history. Um, like you, you can almost say that um, one of the reasons for the huge success of the insurance industry over the last 100 years or so is down to actuaries. Um, before the emergence of actuaries, it was it was quite likely that uh, or it was kind of more likely that than it is now for an insurance firm to go to, uh, to go insolvent. Um, actuaries emerged then and effectively put forward a proposition whereby um, the actuary would be personally uh, responsible for looking after the, the public interest um, would, would, would have you to maintaining uh, the solvency of, of the firm. And this is, in my view, kind of a wonderful ethical construct. So in the world, it, it's not really reasonable to, to expect people to behave in, in kind of an ethical way. But th this particular one um, uses self-interest in that it's in the self-interest of, of a shareholders of, yeah, um, to have a, a functionary to look after the kind of long-term solvency. 
Um, it's also in the interest of, of those who uh, want to buy insurance as well, because if, if it means that the risk of solvency is lower, um, that, that's something in, in their interest as well too. Um, what it meant though was that the primary function of, of the actuary was both ethical and to do with uh, being able to do the numbers in the right way. Um, effectively, they, they had to have the character to be able to stand up um, against uh, a majority in an insurance firm who might have interests other than the long-term uh, solvency of, of it. Um, because of the failure of equ equitable life, um, the credibility of that um, has fallen down. And that's something that we need to be aware of. And I, ideally speaking, something that we need to uh, reverse in the future. Um, there's also been some kind of scares regarding actuarial employment. Um, in one particular country, um, it was noted that the, one of the main employers came to one of the main universities uh, a couple of years ago and said, we don't want to hire your actuaries anymore. We're going to hire data science uh, uh, individuals instead. And what subsequently happened though was a year and a half later, uh, the same firm went to the same university and says, oh, actually we made a mistake there. And they don't seem to understand things as widely as, <clears throat> as actuaries. So um, we will uh, revert to hiring actuaries. Um, one of the other contributors, uh, a data science recruiter, was saying that that is actually quite a common thing that happens. But typically what happens is the employer then tries again and they aim to get the right kind of flavor of uh, that the, the data scientist. Um, so there does seem to be kind of a, a threat there. Um, not everyone on the task force would see it that way. Some would see that we need to uh, improve our education and then we'll be okay. And that's that's probably, that has a lot of, um, if you look out in the world right now, there, 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 there is a significant demand for actuaries um, with skills in this area. Um, the other views would be that there is, is a threat um, that uh, significant members of the actuarial profession have been talking about this for a while. Um, the way the, uh, the salaries have changed um, is, is a factor. Um, in Ireland, one of the data science recruiters um, was able to give me lots of examples <coughs> of <coughs> actuaries being, excuse me, <coughs> um, <coughs> was able to, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. They, 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 they were able to give me, <coughs> examples of actuaries being replaced by the, the data scientists. And this, from my perspective, anyway, um, is a concern. I'll say more about that later on. One of the other challenges is, as mentioned earlier on, um, any syllabus would need to be attractive to actuaries. Um, one of the perspectives from some of the other associations was that they felt a lot of actuaries are in a kind of a comfortable place, typically in the mid stages of their career. And so that they're not as enthusiastic about uh, picking up new skills. Um, any syllabus that we would create would need to be kind of a best in class. So it's, it's, it's attractive and seen as useful. And um, there's also a danger as well in that Actuaries would usually be considered to be kind of a conservative association um, for any students of political economics. Um, you'd know that all shocks to the system usually happen under conservative rule. Say, if you take, say, the UK as an example, the repeal of the Corn Laws um, happened under uh, conservative rule and Brexit um, also happened recently under conservative rule. Much of actuarial work um, nowadays, or compared to the past, 
is much more tick box type. And this is kind of right for some kind of, <clears throat> um, some kind of a competition. Um, <clears throat> you, you, you could also say that the, the historical barriers to entry um, that a, a lot of the actual maths that we had to learn in the past no longer is there because of um, IT and so on. Um, the data science recruiters who I spoke to uh, told me that they that, that the data scientists would typically learn how to price uh, insurance uh, products. Um, so it, it it is something that other others are learning about. Um, not only us. And one of the viewpoints is that um, this syllabus that we are working on likely requires significant investment in new uh, actuarial educational materials in the future. And I'll say more about that later on. So to come to the actual um, syllabus itself, um, what are the principles that we that we considered were important. Well, um, in in short, um, we considered um, that probably one of the best approaches that we could take would be to aim to classically <clears throat> educate actuaries in this field up to a level where they could judge the merits or otherwise of professional data science work. <clears throat> um, They could, <clears throat> um, if they wanted, um, obviously be, be become an expert in um, smaller areas of that. Um, to give you an, an analogy of what we mean, if if you consider an orchestra, um, the aim would be to train the actuary so they could become the conductor, in which case they would need to know <clears throat> um, how to play probably um, at least some of, of the instruments. Uh, but they wouldn't need to be a complete expert um, in playing them, but they would need to be able to judge them um, in, in a, a, um, at, at a high level. In terms of the, <clears throat> the, the, the kind of overview of, of the syllabus that we created, um, one of the, the main kind of perspectives that we got from from talking to actuaries was that they felt that the reason why you'd hire an actuary <clears throat> rather than um, a, a specialist um, in data science is that an actuary typically has a broader um, skill set. They understand the, the business and they have uh, professional skills. We have a, a, a strong ethical tradition um, in in what we do, and it was felt on the task force that maintaining that um, uh, structure of of an offering um, was was probably the way forward. Um, so, as uh, one way to put it, would be that we're aiming to build on the foundation of the existing education that actuaries would get. Um, that probably creates somewhat of a gray area because like when I qualified, I wouldn't have done any machine learning. Um, machine learning is now somewhat in the education syllabus um, of actuaries if they qualify now. And then the idea was uh, to build on that extra uh, technical and practical skills, um, extra business and kind of real world skills. And also then to kind of have um, um, uh, um, kind of human and et ethical skills as well too. And again, all with a focus on the data science. And then the idea is with, with all of them, um, if you get through all that, um, you would be considered to have a capacity to make a trusted ju judgment in this area. Um, that brings us to those three columns. So the first of them, um, which was easily the hardest one um, to, to work on, um, 
which was the technical and the practical skills. So we we did an awful lot of work here. We discovered lots of material. We saw lots of ways to present that. And one of the risks that we felt was that <clears throat> you might learn a lot about this particular field, but there might be some bits you've left out. And we tried lots of iterations to work out, okay, <clears throat> how can we present this in such a way where it gives a holistic um, view of, 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 of the landscape, if, if, if you want to call it that. And the way we currently have it um, is that um, an actor would need to understand the numbers, the data, some of the data now is, is in words. They now, they'd also need to learn. So all the new things in that area, they need to learn. Then there's also the tools and the methods um, that you can apply um, the new ones. And then there's also uh, the third area, which is, okay, so you've got all the tools, you've used them, how can you kind of uh, deploy the results, uh, including uh, visualizing them? The second pillar, um, which is kind of a business and professionalism skills, um, one kind of like a, a, a real world um, element, we kind of figured that um, there was kind of kind of a broader skills here. Um, and I'll talk more about these um, when we go into the granular level in, in a few more slides. And then there was the kind of ethics and uh, human skills, which, which again, I'll, I'll say more about as we get into the more granular level. Roughly speaking, it's um, one of the main kind of comments we got from employers was that what they want an actuary to be able to do would, is to kind of get the data, do something with it, uh, but to also understand what is the story and then be able to kind of communicate that story in a way that is commercially useful. So understanding the story, the narratives, if you want to call it that, understanding the individuals involved, uh, their characters, and being able to do that in a way where uh, it creates some degree of trust um, was what, what um, an employer was, was after. Um, in terms of the granular uh, perspectives here, so um, we did an awful lot of work here. Uh, we're only presenting a very small part of that. The, the idea is to present it in a way that it might be easier for you to kind of give your comments um, um, on it. So uh, what we have is, is still work in progress. And the idea is that we will be looking to kind of consult in, in kind of a wider way to get views on what we've done in order to make uh, an additional iteration. Almost if, if you want to say we're, we're following the actuarial control uh, cycle on things. So the um, the, the first area <clears throat> is the, the technical and the practical skills. Um, as we were saying before, um, you can almost split them into three areas. One I'd call dataology, which is understanding all the modern the data that's out there. Again, it's numbers and words. Um, then there's the kind of methods and the tools, um, which kind of new ones are there, how might they be used and so on. And then it's how might you uh, deploy and visualize the results. And the aim would be that <clears throat> an actuary can understand this and also uh, uh, to do this with efficacy as well. Um, there is a lot of prerequisites here in terms of maths, um, but there's also kind of a gray area. So if, if you're an experienced actuary and you're looking to learn more about this particular area, there are kind of some of your maths from the past that you might have forgotten that you might need to kind of refresh a little bit. Um, there's also kind of a gray area in that some of what we have in the syllabus is um, 
in the current AAE education one, um, but not everyone who has 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 qualified will have covered the more recently added material there. So in terms of, of starting off, there's almost a, a basics um, that would need to be kind of covered, um, which is so under, understanding the following aspects. So there's um, lots of concepts which might not have been there in the past. So you, say, for example, machine learning, uh, wasn't really around when I qualified. Um, there's a variety of terms, um, and often the terms used uh, can be quite confusing. Say, for example, with machine learning, um, this is typically known as statistical learning to uh, someone in a stats uh, uh, field. If you're in a business field, it's referred to as predictive analytics. Um, the principles and almost the philosophy of things have changed as well um, since I, I suppose that I went to college. Um, when I went to college and learned a lot about this initially, one of the main principles was of parsimony. And there was kind of a lot of reluctance to, to ever use the word prediction. Um, you, you might use the word estimation, but, you know, in, in a very kind of apprehensive way. Now, um, the philosophy of it has become a lot more confident, maybe overconfident. Um, there's use of the term neural networks that are, that's like the brain and all that kind of stuff. Um, so the, there is a kind of a change in, in, in the tone of things, the change, like almost if, I, I almost think if a modern data scientist um, was trying to answer an exam 25 years ago, they would be marked down in, in terms of the language that they used. But it, it, again, we're in a modern world um, and that's the way things are now. And it, it's important to understand that. Um, there's also um, assumptions. Um, when we did stats years ago, um, we would have learned about, say, with regression, there's certain assumptions there if they don't hold well, then uh, the results won't hold. In, in a similar way, the modern techniques have assumptions and un understanding them is, 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 is important. Uh, various kind of challenges and, and limitations exist. Um, there's also, again, a lot of new jargon um, and the issue of, of explainability has, has become uh, a, a big issue. So I've almost presented them here uh, in a graphical way. Um, that's, I think, so to come on then would be to look at um, what I'm calling dataology. Um, I don't think this is a term used very often. I think there's a couple of firms uh, call this. Um, the, the idea is to kind of, um, like an, an actuary would need to uh, show that they have an understanding of modern that data. And that includes all the things that, that are new in the last 10 years or so. So there's a lot of storage uh, technologies out there, for example, uh, in, in the cloud. There's the idea of training data that wouldn't have been around before. Uh, data infrastructure, data architecture, data pipeline, data scraping to pull information off the internet kind of stuff, uh, data wrangling. <laughs> um, actuaries would have pretty much been data wranglers in the past, but they would have uh, uh, used other words there. <laughs> then there's uh, data engineering, uh, which is, there's there's various different ways to kind of structure numbers um, and data now than there was in the past. For example, in the past there was SQL. Now there's almost like no SQL as well. And that, that's just a, a small example. And so in summary, there's lots more data out there and understanding that field, um, it would be kind of a core element of the syllabus for actuaries here. And again, that's that's putting it 
in, in kind of a, a graphical form. Then to move on, so if you understand more of the data that's there, then an actuary would ideally want to know, okay, what are the tools and techniques that I can apply uh, to that? So we'd look for an actuary to demonstrate technical proficiency in the use of modern data science methods and tools. Um, roughly speaking, um, an actuary would need to understand, okay, what methods and tools exist? Uh, where might they be used? When might they be used? Um, how do you use them? And why might you use them as well too? So um, almost having the technical skills, but again, um, there's an element of the kind of uh, business real world um, element there as well too. Almost the, uh, a, a practical um, element. Um, one of the other issues as well is um, this particular part of the course is very was was very challenging um, for us to come up with because there's an awful lot of emerging tools and techniques. Um, Dr. Greg Doyle um, from one of the uh, colleges here in Ireland, he runs an MSc course that's aimed at, at professionals in the insurance field. And he was saying he evolves his syllabus roughly about 10% a year uh, because of the emergence of new, new, new tools. So when we were uh, thinking of, okay, how can we structure uh, the syllabus in this way? So it seems sensible to have a kind of specific area for kind of new and emerging tools. Um, when it comes to kind of the tools as well, there's various kind of perspectives that can be taken. So for example, someone can be doing some modeling um, or someone can be doing some uh, strategy work. So um, if we kind of look at these in, in more, at a more granular level, um, again, this is kind of the big meaty uh, technical element. So the main almost new uh, topic uh, would be machine learning. As I was saying before, this is referred to sometimes as statistical learning, sometimes as predictive analytics, if you're coming at things from a business uh, viewpoint. There's other related topics like uh, data mining, which is about uh, trying to discover what's in a particular data set, um, while machine learning is more about uh, prediction. Um, in order to be able to use this in a practical way, uh, understanding the potential benefits and the limitations is pretty important. There's various concepts here, which be quite new uh, to actuaries. There's model training, which is which involves kind of estimation and assuming uh, a target is defined. Model validation, which is something that we are already uh, familiar with, but um, done in a machine learning space. Uh, there's feature engineering, uh, feature scaling, regularization, and other, other concepts. Then um, one of the elements that we found quite challenging and initially quite confusing was in terms of the approaches. Um, in other syllabuses, they often kind of split things into uh, unsupervised learning, uh, and supervised learning. And then in those in those splits, they would have listed uh, kind of approaches in each one. What we found is that most of the or most of the algorithms that you could use in each of the, these approaches could almost be used in in any of the approaches. Um, not always. So it it didn't seem to make sense to to kind of to list. <coughs> Um, algorithms, if, if you want to call it that, under each approach. Um, it's almost like um, it's a little bit more complicated. So in terms of the approaches that we consider to be quite useful and in terms of kind of headings that were good to kind of structure things, we had a kind of the unsupervised learning and the supervised learning, which would, would te technically include semi-supervised. Uh, there's what's called reinforcement learning or reinforced learning. And then there's <clears throat> uh, 
a more probabilistic approach or a Bayesian approach. And then there's other types as well, too. Um, when we come down to a more granular level here, so within e each of those approaches, there's various machine learning algorithms that can be used. And this is an area which, it, which is, again, is kind of growing in, in quite a rapid way. So um, there's, a, there's a very, very long list <coughs> of, of algorithms that, that would be used. Neural networks um, would be one of the main ones. Um, there's lots of other ones here. I've listed a few of them and I've uh, more on the next slide with a view to kind of explaining that there's, there's an awful lot of these um, and an actor would need to be at least somewhat familiar with them and also un, un, understand the kind of trends and the, the growth uh, that's happening there. Some of those algorithms are very old, some are, are, are new. Um, and in terms of a kind of an actuarial perspective on things, uh, being able to interpret um, each one and their interpretability would be important. Um, we want to understand the advantages and the disadvantages and the likely usage and ease of use of e each of them. And also an understanding as well, the, the kind of emerging algorithms. Um, so again, there's new ones arising um, almost, well, I wouldn't say every day, but um, it, it is quite a, a rapidly evolving field. Um, the next um, topic in terms of the kind of tools that actuaries would need to know in the data science field is in relation to kind of uh, software skills. So to have at least some proficiency in software skills would, would be uh, probably a prerequisite. Um, there's various different programming languages. Actuaries typically use R and Excel, um, but um, most other data science professionals would use Python. Um, again, that's something that I, I think as, as a profession, we need to think more about. There's also the kind of new no-code uh, programming, um, which seems to be coming uh, more to the fore as well. Um, one of the other issues around software skills is understanding um, the kind of code versionings um, that exist and various kind of software engineering concepts and code libraries. So it's almost like when someone writes some kind of code, they often share that online and you can use other people's code. Um, um, there's also kind of uh, one of the issues that arises there is the reliance on the opinion of others. Um, when I was becoming an actuary, um, that concept of relying on the opinion of others was always something that had to be kind of uh, reported. Um, so if, if, if an actuary is using these kind of or packages and so on, they, they, they would need to understand that they're effectively relying on the opinion of others. The next kind of big topic in, in kind of the tools and techniques would be modeling and strategy. So an actuary would need to kind of uh, show a technical proficiency in the use of modeling and, and strategy. Um, modeling is something that most of us are familiar with, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Um, the strategy side of it, um, um, of the feedback we've gotten so far, um, quite a number of actuaries would see this as a potential competitive advantage for actuaries. So understanding why you are doing the, the type of that data, data, data science work. Um, and as part of that, <clears throat> there would be a necessity to know the limitations of any uh, project, know where you might need to hand over to an expert in one area, know the kind of concept and, and know the context and the landscape and if it's uncharted territory and know what the project uh, will be used for and why. And again, understanding the overall story of, of how things are operating. And then um, 
one of the other big elements here is, as, as I mentioned before, the kind of emerging methods and tools. Um, if we are to create a syllabus, one of the natural challenges is it's an evolving field. Um, so managing that in the syllabus, it seems natural to have a kind of an emerging tools uh, area which would be expected to evolve each year. So we'd expect actuaries to show kind of a wherewithal to keep up to date um, with these new uh, tools and also to keep up to date with other uh, developments in that data science. So in terms of what are some of these new ones, so one of the obvious examples is natural language processing. Um, most people have heard now of chat GPT. Um, there's lots of products like that probably launching very regularly. So that's, that's kind of probably the most uh, heard of one, but there's lots of other ones out there. There's also kind of other kind of wider areas as well, um, which uh, technically isn't under the emerging tools, although the, it, it, again, that they, they are somewhat emerging. Um, there'd, there'd be things like recommender algorithms, um, managing fraud, uh, image analysis, um, object uh, uh, detection, um, self-driving vehicles, um, medical uh, imaging and diagnostics, uh, robotics, robo-advising in investment. And there's also the kind of the big area of kind of hardware and the costs and the economics of, of, of it as well, uh, particularly on the data storage part. Um, the third part then um, of the technical and, and practical skills is in terms of um, uh, being able to to deploy um, the the kind of the results. Um, there'd be a lot of kind of actuarial app applications here. Um, uh, one of the main form of of this is in data visualization. I won't spend too much time on that. Um, so to come on to the next kind of main pillar and um, that we had earlier on, and that was the business and professional skills, um, almost the, the kind of the real world um, part of things. If um, I was discussing the syllabus with uh, a bunch of actuaries last week, and uh, one of the main comments I got uh, back was that, oh, um, okay, if you know the numbers and the tools, and how to kind of use the results. The most important other thing would be regulation. So that this whole field is uh, is regulated quite heavily. It's likely to be heavily uh, heavily regulated again in the future, uh, particularly in the EU. Uh, there's the AI for life, AI for good, and and so on. Um, there's also the kind of the business context here as well. Um, although actuaries would naturally be educated in this area, there's newer elements um, which are appropriate for the, the data science. Say, for example, there's new stakeholders involved uh, sometimes. Um, there's also kind of new roles as well. Um, there's like a, a data wrangler, a data ethicist, an AI ethicist as well. And there's also new, uh, more senior level roles, say a chief data officer and a chief ethics officer. Um, in my opinion, I think if the if the if the actuaries that established the profession, say in the UK about two hundred years ago, if they were around now and they were thinking, okay, what can actuaries add? Um, the kind of the the proposition that they put forward would be very similar to actuaries now saying that we are the ones who should be looking after uh, the data and the ethics um, of it because of our historical experience and so on. Um, the next element <clears throat> here is on client relationships. This is probably something that if you work in a consultancy, 
you probably know a lot about. Um, if you work in a life office, you probably haven't come across it in a huge way. Um, this is actually a key element in the Alliance for Data Science uh, <coughs> Professionals. Um, <coughs> it, it, it almost seems that... <coughs> It almost seems that the typical the data scientist that you might consider to have like a PhD in maths is now, um, or it looks like those individuals will be will be educated in a much broader way, uh, including learning about client relationships. So this is something that might already be in a typical uh, CPD course for actuaries. But um, it, it seems like it, it, it would be appropriate um, from a data science perspective. Um, I suppose we all mostly work in a world uh, where we're doing lots of numbers. But like in, in the real world, um, I know most of the senior people I used to work for in the past used to always say that the world mainly works on human relationships rather than being based on numbers. Then there's the kind of uh, the communication and the teamwork element. So um, most actuarial education syllabuses have added communication over the last 20 years or so, uh, being able to kind of communicate the technical issues in, in a way that's under, un, understandable and um, helpful to others is, is a key skill. Um, with the emergence of data science, there probably are extra uh, challenges in this area. And, and again, uh, specific uh, training and specific mentioning of, of, of this uh, is likely important. Um, being able to kind of explain what's happening um, is, is key. Also, one of the other, other points that came up um, from our consultation so far is regarding teamwork as well uh, learning how to work in in a team um is is considered uh very important then the next uh topic would be innovation skills um one of the one of the groups that invited me uh in to have a chat with them uh, was the Irish life innovation team um they were specifically inviting me in, probably mostly so they could hire more of my students. Um, but I got the feeling there that they, that like I, I in UCD, um, I, I, I've looked after the work placement program for the last maybe, or looked after for about five years um, overall. And in that time, it like it's, it, it almost becomes uh, clear that there's kind of hierarchies of actuarial roles. So there's kind of like, like if you're doing uh, quotes, that's probably down the lower end of it. If you're doing the valuations, that's somewhere in the middle. If you're in a product development role, that's probably um, slightly higher up. It almost seems to me that a new, um, a new kind of type of actuarial role would be working in one of these kind of innovation hubs and that would require what the employers are looking for is to show it showing that they have um kind of they're able to use their actual skills in a creative way and that they have a capacity to take kind of concepts outside of the finance and insurance industry and use them in the finance and the insurance industry and also that they have a capacity to kind of evolve uh, existing methods and tools in, in this area. Um, the idea of project management, um, it, we consider it to be uh, a, a reasonable topic to include, um, likely in the form of having case studies of how insurance companies have evolved um, um, because of all of what's happening um, in this field and what kind of projects they had um, as part of that. The next area would be kind of uh, business leadership and C-suite skills. Um, 
a lot of younger actuaries would frequently say to me that, um, you know, the overall actuarial syllabus is missing kind of C-suite skills, um, which they would see others having. Um, they do seem to be likely to be important in this area as well too like if, if someone is looking to move into this area and they're looking to get a job as, as a chief uh, data officer a chief ethics officer um, having these uh, skills would, would be considered uh, very useful and then more broadly in the business and professional skills the idea of you know okay so you have all this new skills you understand the data you understand the tools you know how to kind of apply them in the real world and um, ultimately applying them to actual problems would be um, a significant part of that the next then main pillar would be the kind of the ethical and the human um skills as i mentioned earlier on this is one of the kind of the key reasons why actuaries uh, existed. I, I suppose that's, that's from a kind of a London uh, centric uh, viewpoint. Um, the structure here is very simply that when something is happening, there there's an overall story and what an employer um, is looking for. Well, in a role that's not that doesn't have to be filled for regulatory purpose, for purposes, but one that's kind of there for commercial ones what they're looking for is that uh, a professional can kind of see a scenario work out what the story is uh engage with the numbers and then make that explainable uh to others so um being able to kind of work out what the story is um assess that in some way uh evolve that in some way and from an actuarial viewpoint, one of the kind of risks might be a narrative risk where the story that's being used is overly simplistic um, rather than having um, all the kind of nuances that, that would be more progressive. One of the other elements then is within any kind of story, there is kind of individuals and their character is 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 quite important um again this is something that we probably don't talk about too much but if you're hiring someone um it 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 it, it is something that that would be uh highly important and ultimately the reason uh the kind of the human element here is that uh you're aiming to do something in a way which is uh which other people can trust and there's kind of issues around that which i'll explain in the next few slides so um as, as as kind of an overview here in terms of the kind of the ethical and the human skills in, in a way they're standalone skills uh, in a way we probably have them uh implicitly el elsewhere um so there, there is there is a degree of crossover um we are probably light on them in terms of um like i, I know a lot of actuaries and they say they much prefer to be working on a big spreadsheet that exists uh, rather than to start one from scratch um so th there are a lot of kind of almost um you know ethical and human skills which some people might think oh i don't know how to do that but actually it's it's a skill um like i i can clearly remember um when we first started teaching communication skills at university and you'd get young actuaries and you put them in front of a camera okay this is big uh clunky ones uh years ago and they hated the experience so much they wanted to they, they hated it but then when they learned the skills about six weeks later they were like a newsreader kind of stuff so it's almost like that there, there's an awful lot of skills that actually think i oh, know i can't do that but but they're kind of their skills that can be learned rather than something that uh, someone has or has not got um a lot of these kind of skills were almost traditionally learned on the job and um, but the way the profession has expanded so much it makes sense for us to, to kind of at least in my opinion to, to kind of uh provide this education um in 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 an overall way too so um, what is in this part of the course? Well, the first part is in relation to narratives, which is another word for a story. 
Um, in other data science syllabuses, this is typically referred to as storytelling. Uh, so that's not what you would, you know, it's not a telling a story to a child. It's understanding that in the real world, uh, people engage with stories rather than with uh, analyses. Um, the story is how you, you structure um, it all. And what we would be looking for is that uh, an actor would be able to develop a wherewithal to make a progressive uh, judgment on ethical narratives related to that, that data science. And ultimately, it's, it's about turning the data into a human story. Uh, the, the steps there would be, okay, working out what is going on, um, then assessing it in some way and working out how you might evolve it. Again, as they're saying, this is known as storytelling. Um, this is probably my Pacific area as well. I, I've, I've recently done a, a PhD um, in, in this area. Um, so the kind of key idea is that narratives dominate and limit analyses. Um, and in order to be kind of effective and to kind of engage with the powerful things that are out there, what you need to do is you need to engage at the narrative level uh, in order to be able to act in the public interest. Um, I've been teaching this in UCD for about six, seven years now. And what I found initially was that, or what I, what I taught initially was that the students wouldn't like it too much because they wanted, they love sums. Um, but I've actually been surprised that they, they do actually like it. Um, some even say they love it, uh, mainly because they, they find it kind of a practical and a real world skill, which they, they, they consider will be useful in their careers. In UCD, what we do is we take kind of a classical uh, narrative approach where we're looking at things as they are, rather than looking at what's called a romantic narrative, which is looking at a story as someone wants it to be. And in order to be able to engage with the world in an effective way, it's necessary to see things um, as they are. So um, the meme um, on the right-hand side, most of you have probably seen that on LinkedIn or elsewhere. And it's the, the I, idea of being able to get uh, some kind of data and turn it into a story and also being able to kind of understand that and engage at, at the story level, which is uh, important. One of the other aspects here um, is, you know, if you have a story, you've got people in the story and you need to be able to make a kind of progressive ju judgment on the human matters uh, in relation to data science. Um, Part of that is understanding the kind of individuals involved. So being able to kind of assess and manage and develop uh, the individuals um, that involves assessing the character of some of the, some of the people involved. And also if you have a certain character and you're managing them or you can Im influence them, um, uh, how you might go about that. And Ultimately, it's about assessing data science from a human uh, perspective. Um, for me, this is going to be very big in, in the future. Um, like we were saying earlier on that neural networks discuss about how uh, really they're, it's kind of like the brain and so on. Uh, from a classical perspective, uh, the, the, the human mind is not your brain. Um, it's kind of a combination of, or it's an, an, um, an analogy would be to say, uh, from a human being's perspective, if they look out on the world, they're looking out on the world through almost a filter of their heart. So uh, an individual will see the world partly the way the world is, but also partly the way that they actually are as well. They also need a certain amount of kind of light and energy, um, which they get from their gut um, as, as, an, as an analogy. And then their brains are actually limited to only operating within uh, the boundaries set by the world that they see and the kind of the light and the energy that's out there. And um, this particular perspective is 
pretty useful in terms of uh, managing the kind of the ethics around uh, that the, the data science. So if you have a, a fairly malevolent individual and if they get uh, machine learning, they can obviously use that to do malevolent things uh, out there in the world. If you have someone in almost the opposite way where they're aiming to kind of work in a constructive way, um, the machine learning uh, can act in a constructive way. But ultimately, um, the machine learning is ultimately ones and zeros. And it's ultimately created by a human being. So that the human being might set uh, the program. Uh, the way they set the program is influenced by who they are, the kind of delight and, and, and the energy that they have in their mind, or if they're part of a team, the collection of hearts and the collection of, of energies. And if you're to assess the kind of the ethical side of things, um, assessing that kind of human input is really important. Um, this is also, in, in my personal opinion, something that is likely to grow substantially in the future. So um, at the moment, um, that data science is very much all about ones and zeros. Um, but there is a new field, um, say, uh, this, this is probably a, a personal view. My wife has recently grown a human heart uh, from stem cells, but not in the form of, uh, not in the normal shape of a heart. Um, it seems like there will be, uh, in the future, that there could easily be human organs um, attached to uh, computers, and that will kind of change things um, a lot more. And also, again, the, the kind of ethics around um, all of this would be uh, a big thing. Um, so, so again, this is something that I think um, actuaries naturally, um, we have a history um, in, in this particular area of working in the public interest. Uh, with numbers and so on. Like, um, I, I love looking at the uh, a piece from 1851 um, uh, published by the Institute of Actuaries back then where there was uh, a conversation of, of a bunch of actuaries and they, you know, the actuarial profession had been founded and they were thinking, okay, yeah, we're going to look after the solvency in the insurance world. But at that time, they actually felt that all commercial entities would eventually have an actuary. And they thought that very simply because they that they considered that to be a kind of a win-win. As in, if you have an organization um, where it's it can be shown to be uh, more trustworthy, um, uh, the customers are likely to engage with that um, a lot more. Um, like I know for me, you know, I'm I'm probably not as as careful with my data as I'd probably like to be. Um, I would prefer not to share it most of the time. Um, I don't. I definitely don't feel that I can trust a lot of the organizations that would get their hands on my data. If, however, um, there was organizations which I felt I could trust, I I would be much more likely to share my data with them. So so. For me, um, um, whichever profession, and hopefully it's the uh, actuarial one, um, can get a grip of this area uh, where the public would trust them, I, I, I guess. Um, I, I think there would be huge um, upside. So and that, that le leads us into the next uh, topic, which is in relation to trust. Um, ultimately, um, it's about, you know, can an actuary uh, show a wherewithal to assess and achieve uh, trustworthiness? Um, if you can trust something, um, you know, you're, you're, you're creating a more valuable service, you can probably charge more for it. Um, what, what I noticed um, with the Alliance for Data Science Professionals was that uh, one of the key elements for them was achieving efficacy. And again, it's very hard to be completely effective in something if there's not a degree of trust that is created. Um, 
in terms of that, you know, that there's there's kind of ethical principles which would need to be kind of understood. Um, I'm not I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but that that the, 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 there's a kind of a a um relatively straightforward kind of course that that actually could do um on this where they would be able to develop an understanding of of uh, the following kind of ethical principles and constructs and then be able to make uh, a judgment uh, using them. Um, what this mostly comes down to is um, uh, three kind of areas. One is compliance. So uh, an actor would, be able, would need to be able to show kind of a wherewithal to make progressive ju judgments regarding adhering to and respecting current cultural traditions and regulations in this field. So it's an imperative to uh, to understand kind of existing norms and achieving kind of compliance with professional and regulatory standards. What this means, and it, um, uh, we're almost framing what most of you have probably heard of uh, here, which is, you know, the issues of, you know, fairness, uh, bias uh, in, um, in loads of ways, uh, the issue of privacy as well. All of these come down to kind of what, um, at a compliance level, they come down to what are the standards that are set by the regulators and also by the kind of cultural norms as well too. The next kind of ethical uh, uh, part here would be that if someone understands the norms and understands what 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 they need to do to comply with them, it's natural when they understand that that they might want to kind of improve on things. And one of the kind of things there would be to show uh, a wherewithal to be able to transgress norms, to create new and more progressive norms within the application of that the data science. And again. This is, uh, from my perspective, a key uh, thing that actuaries have done in, in the past. So like in an insurance company, they might say, okay, let's go out and do X, Y, and Z. And this is the story and everybody agrees with it, but the actuary might come along and says, no, this is gonna lose money or the reserves won't be high enough and all that kind of stuff. So, and they have to propose uh, a new norm um, in a place of that. And again, the, the aim here is obviously to kind of excel at things um, and there's a commerciality to it, as in we we all mostly exist in, in the corporate world. And then the kind of the next level after that, as in if someone understands all the norms that are out there, they know how to comply with everything, but they also know it so well that they can excel at it and they can excel in a way which is good for their self-interest. Um, there's also kind of an additional wherewithal if you can kind of excel at something that you know, not just how to look after yourself more, but how to kind of um, act in a more progressive social way. So the idea here is to show wherewithal to be able to transgress norms, to replace, uh, sorry, to create new and more progressive and socially responsible norms um, in the application of the, the, the data science. So the idea here is of the helmsman um, looking after the ship. Um, so in terms of next steps and discussion, um, so the, the main one today is, as I was saying before, is to kind of consult with stakeholders. The main ones are obviously um, the members of the profession um, and then to evolve the syllabus in, in response. Um, hopefully the next step after that would be to fund and create new uh, educational materials to enable actuaries to adhere to the syllabus. Um, I would think the most natural way to do that would be at the kind of European level uh, for uh, economies of scale and in the interest of the smaller associations. Um, as I was saying before, like, like I am conscious that I am talking about a threat to the profession. Um, I'm also conscious that usually when someone talks about something which, which sounds kind of incredible, um, they can not only not convince people, but they can be thought of maybe as a little bit 
foolish um, as well. And um, that doesn't, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not afraid of, of that. Um, I'm, I'm kind of conscious that um, my experience, I've seen uh, credible threats, if, if you, you want to call it that, that would lead me to believe that um, we need to act. Um, on the other hand, I would also say that, you know, if, if some of you are thinking, oh, I, I don't really um, like this particular view of things, I, I would think you'll be caught off guard or we'll be caught off guard. I think if we you know, don't believe it, we will be neglecting everything that matters. But on the other hand, on a more positive viewpoint, I would see what's currently happening as, as a kind of a wonderful opportunity for us, as in uh, to kind of, uh, you know, reinvent a lot of what we do, to kind of um, reimagine what we do for the future, to refresh our skills. And like, I, I know so many amazingly talented actuaries that I've no doubt that we have more than sufficient talent in the profession to more than meet the ch ch challenges that, that are out there. I'd also see that we easily have enough resources as well. So I, I don't think we have anything to fear here uh, um, other than our own in, in action. Um, the next thing would be regarding kind of um, assessment issues. Um, I think any kind of new assessments in this area will have to probably evolve in the same way that um, you know, we used to do a maths exam and then there was calculators and then you had to have an exam with a calculator. In the future, I'd say uh, exams will mostly be online. They'll mostly be open book with the internet, probably with chat GPT as well. So that, that there is kind of a challenge there. And ultimately, anything that we produce um, will need to have a designation, um, almost a currency uh, attached to it that actuaries can then use so it can help them get uh, new roles in this area. But that's that's probably something that um, probably isn't good to talk about today. Uh, we're mainly talking about the, uh, the syllabus. So um, with that, I think I'm going to hand back to Henning and say, uh, Thank you very much for your attention. And um, if you don't get to comment or if you have any, any, any kind of comments afterwards, feel free to, to email me and I'm happy to pass those comments on to the task force. So um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Colm. Um, that was, from my point of view, a, a very interesting and, and detailed discussion. And um, you know that I and knew the presentation, but still it gave me a lot of insight into the task force's thinking, the motivation behind it. And I think it has a couple of dimension or layers where we could have a long discussion on around <clears throat> not only the technical content, why this specific technical content, how to update it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's, I think, one, one story for itself. But perhaps you could just just briefly elaborate again on on the initial structure for the syllabus saying it has of course a business context it has an ethical context uh, it has a technical context um wh why you decided to kind of continue the the, the basic structure of our general course syllabus for actuary education, why it is important to kind of transfer this into a data science thinking, um, which from my understanding is, is kind of the core idea of, of this structure, like a continuation approach. Is that the correct understanding I have? Yes. Um... I, sh I should also say uh, apologies for the frog in my throat. Um, I'm not sure where the frog has come from. So, um, so um, yeah, yeah. So, like, I, I think um, like that's something that we definitely noticed from the people who have helped us so far. Their view, like, like I, I kind of think of Arno in Belgium. He would say, "Here's what we've done before. 
um, here's the new things that, that have come along. And it, it is uh, like, I, I, like what I noticed was that the, the structure we came up with uh, was actually very similar to, to the structure that's in the, the data and systems part of, of the existing uh, education syllabus. And yeah, yeah, like it, it, I, I think it's kind of something that, um, like if I, I almost think it's it's useful for me in a way in that I, I I might be a typical actuary out there in that I'm in a place where like most actuaries I'm probably in a safe secure place, um, I don't have to do anything, um, I might be thinking okay how long many more years am I going to be working is it worth my while to get involved here um I, I think for us to kind of put something together that is attractive to actuaries it needs to be quite attractive um it, it also needs to have very very good educational materials like I must say I've often thought oh would I like to learn more about uh, that particular field and I look at the various options and it seemed like that there's a lot of part bits so I could learn about this but if I learn about this I won't know about um all these other bits too so having some kind of holistic um ed ed educational element I, I think I think would be attractive and um I, I'd hope um the kind of natural curiosity that that a lot, a lot of actuaries would have um in 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 this particular area might be resurrected a little bit kind of stuff Perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Um, perhaps to, to give the participants a bit of time to digest what um, they have seen, um, one, one other remark that's kind of always on my mind um, around the whole data science um, topic. Um, in, in my experience, especially in, in larger organizations, many secured actuaries, as, as you meant, as you called them, which, which I like uh, a lot, um, see data scientists in 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 the in the same um, departments or in different departments doing similar jobs, different jobs, joint jobs. Um, and and from my experience, it's important for us actuaries to to be able to work together with them to understand what they are doing and especially understand what we can bring to the table and i think you have mentioned quite a lot of um, capabilities and, and and skills actuaries traditionally have that they have to bring into the joint projects um, and, and this is from my understanding something that we have to can kind of kind of present in the first line not saying we want to re-educate you at, at actuaries to become fully fledged data scientists and, and especially not the other way around, but it's more like building on and, and again kind of a repetition building on what defines us and, and, and bringing the, the different skill sets together is that something that that resonates with you. Yes, yes, I, I think so, I, I think, as well as that like I like what I often find is actuaries often compare themselves to each other. And they're often kind of competing against each other and they often forget like how wonderfully talented that they that they, that they that they are and like i think it like i suppose what i'd say to a lot of actuaries would be if you're if you're kind of thinking okay will i get involved in this space more would i be uh interested to have a look at that again i'd say have a go at it um i'd say you, you'd be surprised how intelligent you are kind of stuff um so that like that there, there's like in my experience, actuaries are, are usually very high caliber in individuals. It's it's almost like with a language, if, if you don't use it too often, you lose it a little bit, but it's still there a little bit. So like I I would encourage actuaries if you are feeling, oh, I, I think I'd like to do something new. I think I'd like to learn a little bit more about something. Um, I I, I think I I would I'd really encourage them to to kind of um uh, look in 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 this space a little bit more um it like it, it is probably the future um we are uh we are at, at a time where you know everything's really evolving like if, if you go on to linkedin you'll see kind of new uh in, new ai uh functions arising almost every day 
Um, it, it is something that it, it can be a bit on the, on the daunting side when you see so much change. But one thing that I, I found encouraging from talking to uh, the people we interviewed was that they felt that um, it was possible um, to, to gain a significant understanding of what's happening um, uh, as regards the kind of principles and the underlying things uh, out there in, in kind of a realistic way. And I, I think if, if that was done in that way, I think there would be less kind of maybe fear of, of the new. Um, there would be more of a kind of maybe, uh, oh, I, I, I see that because and I understand what's going on there more than the media uh, or more than the person who's presenting it. And, and I, I see it as being uh, pretty useful. Um, I'd also kind of probably particularly say to kind of younger actuaries as well too, um, that it, it is something that they they should consider. Um, like I think when you're younger, it's, it's much easier to learn. You've got a, um, a much longer future career ahead of you as well too. And so it, it, is, it is more worth your while to uh, invest there as well. Very good. Thank you very much, Colm. Um, we, we, we know each other quite a bit, and I know that we could go on for, for, for quite some time discussing those, those points. Unfortunately, we have not received um, any questions from the audience, so I would like to second what you said initially um, to invite everyone to, to again have a look at the presentation um, and, and rethink what was said. And um, happily contact Colm or myself or other. Yeah. Um, if, if, if there was a hand raised there, I think so, so, so someone might want to ask a question. Yes. Uh, so, Carla, I will. That's not the regular case, but I think we can do it. Um, give you the opportunity to speak. So, Carla, please. Fortunately, we cannot hear you, Carla. No, unfortunately not. Okay. Um, I'd be happy if you want to email me, Carla, and I'm happy to um, answer the question offline. Yes, I think that's, that's the best. So sorry that it did not work out. Um, would have loved to hear Carla and her thinking. Carla, we could try it again. Um, you should be unmuted and I, I, I yes, try. wonderful. My, my wonderful. We can hear you. Ah, okay. Um, I would like first of all to thank you very much for your uh, engagement in this field. Uh, often, even if now I am out of the profession and so on, I am following all the uh, the movement, the innovation of our profession, because uh, I like always so much to be an actuary, because we are uh, received, at least in the past, always a new um, um, ideas to do something of new innovation, innovation, innovation. And uh, I think the column that uh, uh, my impression is after your very wonderful uh, lesson that uh, uh, probably we have to um, uh, run a little bit on this field, in the, especially uh, in education of the young actors, because the senior actors or normally are doing something if they are strongly interesting, interested by the professional point of view. So 
uh, in my uh, um, uh, I am fearing that we have not read enough to teach uh, this matter. Uh, what you have said today, I, I, I have um, read a, a new kind of wording uh, in actuarial field, speaking of data science. So we are really ready uh, to teach this matter to our young and what we can do as European Association to move in this sense, because this um, uh, aspect of the, our profession is uh, beginning always, always more important. So we need to give new tools to our young, and because the young are the future of our profession. So, Colme, really, I thank you so much. What are you suggesting what, for your uh, very in, deep um, observation you made it during your talk? And I am very happy uh, that there ha we have this kind of organization that we can immediately do uh, spread what you have said over the world, everywhere, but particularly in Europe, because it is uh, obviously we are strongly interested in growing up the European profession to keep them always more uh, at the, what the time are requesting. A few years ago, there was no problem of data. Um, we was a problem that we we have faced in with our technique, our uh, process, uh, technical process, so on. But now we have so many information, and I think that, in my view, that we we have to run in learning data by science. So my uh, let me to give a little a little suggestion to take this matter at the attention of all our association to move all together and uh, to create books, papers, what you want, but also the content of your, I repeat, call me, thank you very much, wonderful lesson you have given. And uh, you have also speak about the heart. I think that in our profession, we have always used the mind and the heart. Thank you, Kaulm, for remembering us this very relevant aspect of our profession. Thank you very much, Carla. Thank you very much, Carla. It was um, a, a pleasure to hear from you, and uh, we all very much hope you're doing fine, and thanks for, for your insights on, on this. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure, Henning, it is a pleasure. E even if I am, uh, as you may imagine, uh, a great actor, <laughs> but uh, I am following uh, everything you are doing at the uh, European level. And uh, thank you very much for letting me always uh, uh, inform it uh, on what you are doing. Uh, it, it is always the actorial feed that is always my life. I really appreciate the heart and the spirit in, 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 in those comments. So uh, thank you very much. So Colm, um, just in between, we have received um, an additional question from um, the audience. I will share this. Just give me a second, please. So it's over here. To your experience, are more senior actuaries capable of getting new technical skills or it's more for young students and this moral and ethical part, more responsibility of senior ones? So the distinction between different generations. Yeah, um, I, I, I think it's, it's tricky 
to generalize, um, like one of one of the people we interviewed was Fergal McGuinness. Um, he's probably, I think, slightly older than me. Um, he completely switched uh, from a normal actuarial role, and he took a year or so off and re retooled um, in this area, and he set up a new uh, consultancy. So, so, so that's someone in their forties who pretty much uh, completely went back to school. Uh, that's probably. Um, a minority. I'd, 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 I'd say you're probably right. To, if you're younger, you, you maybe have more of a fire, more of an appetite to learn new uh, skills there. I, I think the onus is, is partly on us uh, in terms of, like, I think ultimately for what we're doing to be successful, we would need to present, um, you know, best in class educational materials, which are fairly uh, accessible. Like, I think if like it was me and I was deciding whether to do a course or not, if it looked in any way kind of overly tricky or or it was going to try to catch me up and things, I'd be like, not, not really, I'd be too risk averse. But if the course was put together uh, in an attractive way, um, in kind of a helpful way and so on, I, I, I think that would be one of the key bits to, to get the uh, to get the more experienced actuaries. Um, from an IFA perspective, um, that that was pretty. Your thinking was pretty much there. I mean, our our uh, our perspective in creating the certificate uh, in data science, which is aimed at mostly aimed at someone if, like if you're a senior actuary and you're managing a team of 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 data scientists, um, you you only need to know the kind of the more kind of higher level bits. Um, and and that would that's what that syllabus is 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 is, is aiming at. Um, I think as as regards the kind of the um, the the moral and the ethical element, um, I I've been teaching that here in UCD for for a while, and um, personally, um, my experience is I often feel completely inspired by. Uh, to perspectives of younger actuaries. Um, I, I think when they go into the world, they, they would probably then uh, the, the, the defer to, 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 to the older ones. And often you probably only see the older ones maybe more confident to kind of express that. But uh, um, in, in my experience, I think we have a wonderful, we, we attract a wonderful cohort of young people. Um, I've lost count of the number of times in my office that I've had uh, young actuaries come in and and say to me, "Oh, uh, how can I get an actual job where I can help people?" So I, I, I think there is an underlying uh, kind of moral and ethical uh, element of 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 the type of students that we attract. Um, one thing I noticed on the task force where, where we all shared our views um, in in the first meeting. The only view I think that we all shared in a very strong way was that the ethics had to be kind of a strong part of 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 what we do, and um, so I I would be actually quite a big believer in in the kind of the underlying ethical capability of of us as a as a as a profession, and that's in spite of uh, again the past failings that that I mentioned. Um, I, I, I like I like I. I I know an awful lot of senior actuaries, and I, I again, I'm personally inspired by their their examples and so on. So, um, I, 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 again, I, 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 I just as I say, I'd be pretty confident um, that I, I think we're in a very strong place, and um, in terms of meeting uh, the challenge that's there, I, I think if we can organize ourselves, I think we have more than sufficient talent. More than sufficient resources uh, where we can use this um, um, uh, use what's happening as almost a spur to kind of uh, to evolve ourselves um, for, for 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 the future. So um, I've, I've got a frog in my throat again. Apologies. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much, Colm. Um, I think you you touched on one point. Um, the, the, the individual situation of an actuary that it might differ to where they um, would put their focus on or, or perhaps not. And that's perhaps something um, as we have received a second question from the audience, which is kind of um, 
quite quite individual and uh happy happy um to pass that on to you so just um how do you suggest the UK pensions actuary should start to upskill themselves in data science when they have never encountered it before, but want to stay aware? Um, perhaps just as a um, last point uh, in, in this area uh, for your personal support to this colleague. Yeah, like I, that, that's lovely to hear that. It's lovely to hear the kind of the appetite is there. Um, I'd say right now if you want to do something immediately i'd say the ifoa certificate in that that, that 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 science is probably the way to go what we're looking to do with the task force is to produce something kind of maybe slightly more elaborate and um, probably kind of more powerful i guess you could say um i would say like if you kind of think of what courses you need to do there's an awful lot of um free material online um there's an awful lot of books um if, if you want to email me i can suggest if if a few books that um actuaries who have kind of uh retooled if if you want to call it that have used so um if if if, if you want to send me an email i'll be happy to kind of send you some resources um all right. Thank you very much. And I think that's that's perhaps just one one last remark. Something you mentioned in the beginning and mentioned again. There's quite something out out, out there um, to to really dig into the data science topic. And and one of the main tasks for for the group is really to to give it a structure that fits for actuaries. And um, I I know and and you know that some associations around Europe have already established their local programs. Um, for data science and and of course they fit locally they might not fit for others uh, they might be in different languages so um again i think it's it's quite important if someone has the appetite to just find the right resources for for, for them to upskill so again com thank you very much for the wonderful presentation and especially to to you and the members of the task force for the work you have already put into this and keep on putting into this as as I know it's still a, a bit to go again thank you very much for your time for your presentation and um, again um, would like to extend the invitation to get in contact with us if there are any additional remarks questions and we will try to keep you updated on the work uh, of the group in the in the month to come so Colm thank you very much okay um, thank you uh, uh, Henny so um, for the reminder of the of the next couple of minutes, I would like to give you only a brief update on what we have been doing in the um, AAE Education Committee just recently. Um, one of the main tasks we had been focusing on was the assessment of the AAE core syllabus, something that we um, spoke about uh, quite a bit or Com spoke about quite a bit. As you know, um, the AAE core syllabus for actuarial training in Europe sets out a minimum framework for local edu uh, actuarial education. Of course, it gives us a harmonization of qualification throughout Europe, which next to others is the basis for our mutual recognition agreement. So um, the acceptance of your local qualification and other member um, associations of the AAE. Uh, perhaps you know, or I assume many of you know that the uh, course syllabus has been updated in 2019, so quite some time ago, and the associations um, were asked to fulfill the requirements by the end of 2022, so that's um, when, or already a bit before that, when we started to assess as an education committee the local qualification routes against the course syllabus that was updated in 2019. Just as a reminder, we spoke about that um, in, in the last one and a half hour. The course syllabus consists of those different areas with quite detailed learning objectives in different areas. Um, you can find the course syllabus online on actuary.eu. Um, something that's quite specific also, but gives quite um, some, some flexibility is practical experience and specialization that needs to be covered within the local qualification. And what we did 
Um, as an education committee, we contacted um, all member associations of the AAE asking for a self-assessment of their local education programs or program, uh, qu quite, quite diverse against the course syllabus. We did receive um, feedback from the associations um, over the last couple of weeks and month, um, just really showing this is our local education program based on university programs, based on things that the associations do, based on exams taken at universities, covered in final thesis of a master's program, for example, or in exams that the associations take against the AAE course syllabus. So what we have done, um, we have set up different reviewer groups um, consisting of members of the education committee, which gives me a wonderful opportunity to thank my colleagues throughout Europe for the work they have put into this, which was quite a lot when you imagine <coughs> associations relating on a university-based education um, system over 10, 12, 15 different universities where you have a, a governance process that you have to understand, where you have B, a language question. Um, normally the education is done in the, in the local language and for the reviewers to understand what is covered, what depth is covered, what breadth is covered is, is quite a challenge. Um, and this gives me the opportunity to extend my, my thank you to all the associations throughout Europe that have worked together with the reviewers team by providing information, by clearing questions and, and giving really profound answers. We are in the final steps <clears throat> of the um, assessments. Many um, have, have been finalized with a very positive outcome. Some are still ongoing as we try to understand um, and try to gather the feedback necessary and of course produce um, the final result from the reviewers reviewer teams, um, but I wanted to give you a short and brief update that we have been working on this quite a lot over the last month. Um, as some of you might have been involved as well from a members of the committee point of view or from a representative of the local association point of view. Um, this just as a brief update, we will um, officially report back to the AAE General Assembly next October. Um, and this is quite, quite a huge chunk of work we have then been uh, putting into this task. Last but not least, <clears throat> I'm very happy to invite all of you to um, the next um, central event the AAE is currently planning, the European Actuarial Day, a one-day online conference on 27th of June which will also take place, um, as I said, in a, in a complete online environment. Uh, participation is free. So if you're interested, um, please join over 550 other colleagues throughout Europe that have already registered for the event. You can see the program um, on the right-hand side with two plenary sessions and two technical um, presentation um, rooms throughout the day. We are very much looking forward to it. Expect a wonderful program with a lot of um, insights into different areas of actuarial practice. And I'm quite sure that something's in it for every one of you. So again, um, would be very happy to welcome you to the event on 27th of June, 2023. With this, um, I'm happy to finalize the presentation, close today's webinar organized by the AAE and um, together with the AAE Education Committee. It was a pleasure to have all of you present. In the, um, in, in the meantime, we were with around 100 participants, which is a wonderful number um, for us to have. We, Colm, I, I think I can extend that um, to you. Um, we very much liked giving the presentation. Hope you had a good time. And again, if any questions occur around the data science syllabus or the work of the education committee, please feel free to contact us um, with the best wishes for the reminder of the day. 
and very much hope to see you soon in the future. Thank you very much and bye-bye. <laughs>